while you're while you're pulling that up, I I wanted to uh, sort of make it a a, a follow-on con uh, comment from the last session. Uh, <clears throat> I really like uh, studies that have been done to sh you know to show the value of LOINC and and what the challenges are. The thing that occurs to me though, and and happens often, is uh, people read that and there are those statements like, uh, you know, the, the codes are co complex. There are a lot of codes and people could choose the wrong ones. Um, uh, you know, a, a, bunch of, a bunch of statements uh, that are all true by the way, but I like to distinguish in my mind, those things that are problems related to coding information versus sort of the challenges of LOINC. In other words, uh, you know, the answer to a lot of the complexity actually isn't because the LOINC codes are, are made incorrectly. It's because we've got to do more education to teach people how to use it. <laughs> and, and I guess what gets a bee under my bonnet is when people who are naive to the issue uh, go to those kind of survey things and sort of use it as a reason either not to use LOINC or to uh, conjecture about creating a competing uh, activity. And yeah, that's that's not what we want. Uh, you know, LOINC is open to changing whatever needs to be changed to make things easier to use. But I mean, you wouldn't, unless you just wanted to ignore uh, you know part of the activity and data that's occurring in the real world you don't you, you don't stop making LOINC codes because they're getting to be a lot of them we need to make the number of LOINC codes that are needed to express what's being exchanged and so um, it's just me whining so I'll, <laughs> I'll quit whining uh, uh, okay, but I, I like the surveys but uh, need to distinguish the difference between things that are just global challenges of representing information in a coded and structured way from things that are particular to LOINC that lead to, you know, LOINC improving or uh, getting better. So. Well, I want to, I want to kind of re reinforce what Stan just said. Um, the, the whole world uh, kind of uh, data handling, interoperability, communication that we're in uh, faces kind of dual pincers in this area. Um, uh, one is because there are uh, so many more people uh, doing this and having to do this, many of whom have no background or very limited background in any kind of informatics. Um, uh, so, so they really aren't familiar with the cognitive kind of uh, approaches to take to even picking a code or even sometimes even understanding what a code is and why you need it. Um, uh, and that is the other pincer, of course, is the fact that um, we're codifying more and more things because we're finding that as things get expressed really effectively uh, in coded concepts and in ontologies, and we begin data mining and doing inferencing, and reasoning and extrapolation and analysis and measurement, uh, meta measurement, I'll call it, not measurement of patient stuff that LOINC is focused on, um, but measurement of our, our use of informatics and coded concepts and terminologies and their efficacy uh, in our overall healthcare delivery system um, uh, as it becomes much more voluminous so uh, we have more people with a limited training and expertise needing to use it and uh, more stuff that has to be used that you need some familiarity uh, with in order to use properly. So I, I see um, the challenge of education and uh, needing to increase investment in making things easier for a broader community um, is if anything, dramatically increasing. And I think the, the huge pressure and growth of focus and volume of stuff to be done around um, uh, responding to COVID um, really has, has shown a light on this particular issue. 
So thank you for bringing that up, Stan. I think it is, uh, it's absolutely spot on. Um, and, um, you know, uh, everybody's doing their best and um, there's limited how much more we can do. So um, in my opinion, we have to continue to focus on, um, on a triage and where we will get the greatest benefit from investment of limited resources and um, and 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 uh, and prime focus on. So with that, um, we have a, um, a a few items on the agenda uh, in our clinical um, uh, meetings. Um, what we typically do, just uh, for the benefit of others that um, have had limited ex limited or no experience in these, um, is we evaluate. Um, uh, certain kinds of things, especially um, those problems that are not obvious and pro forma solutions based upon our standards of practice for creating codes and our current LOINC um, meta model and, um, and a structure of our um, infrastructure of things like the ontology axes and, and uh, the way we want to use scales and properties and methods and all of these other kinds of things in the primary axes. And um, uh, so um, uh, we then generally have uh, pretty robust discussions in these meetings about um, uh, how we can take something that is not obvious that's been submitted and um, uh, slot it into um, how LOINC uh, works now, or if, if we need some kind of extension to what we have, uh, uh, or additional capabilities uh, or definitions uh, in what we have now, uh, then uh, have some, some good broad discussion and input on what the best approach for those, um, uh, those additions or enhancements would be. Um, so did I get that more or less right, Stan? Yep, I think that's right on. So Okie dokie. So with that, um, I think um, the first up on the agenda, um, is uh, 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 um, issues around um, uh, additional answers to quantitative values. Um, and uh, without me uh, trying to remember what all the details of this one uh, uh, exactly are, I would like to turn it over to uh, Jamie um, uh, to uh, continue um, uh, to walk us through uh, what this, uh, these bits are. Thanks, Stan. Um, actually, Brene is going to help me uh, discuss this one. I think she's going to take the lead on it, and we'll go from there. Hello. Here. Oh. You see a big question. And Brene, you sound a little. Yes, we do. We see the presenter view. Yeah, the display you had before was the one you needed. Well, let me swap it back. <laughs> and you sound there a little is. bit remote, uh, far away is at the end of the tunnel yeah you're very echoey can you maybe scoot a little closer do you have headphones is that any better oh, oh yeah perfect. oh yeah <laughs> probably can't hear me at all now we can hear you perfectly we can hear you it's really clear is that any can is that any better did I switch the microphone and then I lost? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? I can. Okay. There, okay. Am I still You're at the end of the tunnel? You're nope. perfect now. Okay, great. I'll just quit now yeah. then. Uh, okay, so we've had a couple of questions or a couple of terms come up where we have quantitative values, but there's an additional answer, at least one additional answer that comes up. So a, a few examples just out of context of a specific link is the number of whatever or how many of something a patient has, but there's at least one non-numeric answer choice, like refuse to answer or unknown or that sort of thing. So we're really looking to see how can we best represent terms with mixed data types for a single observation and we've talked to John Snyder and Clem about this and got some of their feedback, uh, but it really warranted a larger, a larger conversation with the committee. So um, 
I'll show you a few examples. And we already know that fire does not and evidently will not <laughs> allow this sort of data mixing. So we need to figure out, um, like I said, how best to represent those terms. Here's a couple. I've got two specific examples. This first one is a Finex term, and it's how many people are living or staying at this address. But then they also give an answer choice of chose not to answer or did not answer. And that's what this looks like here in the L forms, this sort of highlighted in green here. So, so Ted, help me remember this, Susan. Um, isn't that in flavors of null? Refuses to answer. Yeah, yeah I'm looking so at it, it could be. Well, and that's that's one of the things that has come up in this particular case. This might be a flavor of null, but if we look at the next case, which has to deal with um, HPV shots, the HPV vaccines, the question as it's presented in the protocol is the number of shots, but then they present three choices of instead of giving the number of shots, it's you received all shots or you don't know or you they refuse to answer the question. So we've, we've got both that flavors of null aspect, but then there's other opportunities so, for additional answers. And actually, can I, can I jump in and just ask as, as part of the process, can we ask them to fix their questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, that's exactly that's one of the things that's come up. maybe that oh, isn't a question. choice and we just have to deal with it i guess right but and one, sometimes, one other... sometimes we have some flexibility of doing that but often not well and you want to and I'm, I'm sorry i think we want to get get to the discussion part before we discuss but i'll 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 violate that like the rest of you so uh the <clears throat> What, what people want to do within their own instrument or in their own pick list, because I mean, this, this is a perfectly um, uh, usable strategy in terms of a user interface to this data. But what, you know, what LOINC codes are about is, is exchanging that data. So they could do exactly what they're doing within their own uh, survey or, or, or instrument but when you sent that data, then you want to obey the rules, which are good rules about not mixing data types and, and putting the data where it should be so that, you know, the, the comments that are, you know, reasons for, uh, reasons for null or reasons that data is not present, don't go into the answer to the question. Uh, and so you want to distinguish between what they're doing and what LOINC codes we need to do to support that. Um, so I'll stop there for now. And Dan, I see your hand is raised. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I was trying to be polite and not just jump in. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so Friday you, of a four-day conference. I think everybody's ready for just jumping in. <laughs> um, so you've only shown two examples, um, and I'm sure there's a, a, a bunch more. But I guess what I would say is there, there seems to be at least two strategy to handling the two that you've shown. And I think the first one has already been a hit on, which is there is a very well-known set of these, subset of these for which the solution is this idea of null flavors and where we just sort of defer any answer choice, you know, for a null flavor to that other attribute if the data type that we really want, for example, as you've shown here, that's like a number, is um, you know incompatible with that. So our you know to further clarify that our strategy has been for um, uh, say categorical choices where there's a null flavor mixed in, we just add it to the list, um, recognizing that implementers could choose because they like it. It's nice to see it in the list and, and sort of choose it. Implementers could choose to move that answer choice over to the null flavor attribute as they exchange the data that might sort of in some ways be preferable, but where it's a pick list and they all sort of line up, um, you know, our, our approach has been, we had a lot of discussion about that, right, to sort of stick it in. And that, that's consistent with, or at least not incompatible with the recommendations from HL7 group. 
But the second issue, the one that you have here, where that data type really should be sort of quantitative, um, I guess I want to echo and sort of elaborate what Stan said. I think a, a reasonable approach is, is sort of taking that index question and breaking it down into, into two child sort of link codes. You know, one that matches the sort of correct data type and the second that handles the other cases. And, um, you know, we have a structure to at least put those things together, you know, i.e. I via panels or, or even associated observations. Um, but uh, to me, that seems like, you know, you'd want to capture that. But this, because it's so prevalent, the null flavors one is, we, we kind of have that one solved, I think. At least we can, we can, uh, we can say we have an approach for, uh, for any of those. But you might show us some other examples where I guess all shots might be an example of one that's not a, not a null flavor nor a, nor a, a quantitative number. So we got to do something with that choice. Exactly right. So if we go back to the first example, where it's clearly a null flavor, um, I choose not to answer this question. This one came up because the submitter um, was looking at the LForms example. So the rendering of what we had in the link um, and was concerned because the LForms did not accurately represent the assessment that said, you're either gonna answer with that or um, you know, answer how many, or you're gonna say, I choose not to answer. Hmm. And so it you sounds like, what's that? You gotta talk to, you gotta talk to Clem's group at- uh, We at, did. At, 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 no, what I mean is, in some ways there might be a global strategy for addressing in, in, in this kind of an interface solution, addressing the ability to not answer or provide reasons for not answering, which I think would be independent of the link representation of, of that. But what's helpful for us to know is when do we need, so when do we need to have a single code or have a single code in the link within that assessment? And then, you know, and, or when do we need to create two codes? Or when do we create it as a categorical so, code rather than a numeric, or, so, you know? So, so you, never, you never create a LOINC code for, uh, you know, the, the reasons for no, uh, right. never do that. You won't, you, and then if, if there's any discrepancy in data, because this, this comes up, give, give some other example, maybe you've got some other examples too. I mean, you ask, uh, when did something happen? And they could give you an exact date and time, or they could give you a year, or they could say when I was a child, or right. that kind of stuff. Right. Those are completely different data types, and those are different questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when you make a different LOINC code, is when because because you can't you can't use the quantitative data. Well, put it put it the other way around. You can't use the childhood date in the same way that you could an actual date. In, in decision logic or for shorting the data or any of that kind of stuff. And, and so uh, there may be a reason to, uh, you know, to essentially create a panel. If, if, the, if the two questions are mutually exclusive, you could create a panel and then just describe that you can, you can enter one or the other of these, but you know, the panel, the panel answer or ends up being a number or it ends up being uh, a thing and that's that's not represented by a single white code mm -hmm. but you could you could create a you could create a panel so that you could group them together so that you could easily express exclusion you know exclusion logic related to those two those two concepts I think that's a great idea Stan um, I do want to ask uh, I want to follow up on the comment that Dan made earlier um, I'm wondering, this is so common, uh, kinds of exceptional responses in specifically in surveys, um, if there is some kind of a global approach to this, because, you know, I'm looking at, at the current HL7 Fire and V3CDA set um, for null flavor, and in fact, refuse to answer uh, is not an approved code. Um, and I vaguely recall it being discussed several years ago and rejected, but I can't for the life of me remember uh, why it was rejected. We have things like asked and unknown or not asked and not available. Um, but um, yeah, there may be 
Um, there may be uh, some kind of a general approach for, you know, ask but refuses to answer for cultural reasons or religious reasons, or, you know, there, there, there's, there's all kinds of subtle gradations in, in this. And um, I'm very uncomfortable with adding all of these gradations um, into any specific terminology, either as specialized long answer codes um, or in uh, standard HL7 uh, fire terminology. Um, um, uh, I don't know if anything like this has been addressed by SNOMED. I'm simply ignorant of that. Um, others may know. Um, <clears throat> but this seems to be a, a very widespread, broad, general problem. Yeah, and we, we got a bug clump to fix the L forms view. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So, um... <laughs> You know, following up on Stan, what you were talking about with the panel structure, you know, and thinking a little bit about this more more closely, we probably do have some additional work to think about the the, the kind of panel representation, the modeling representation, and link for that kind of a situation. Because if I recall, in, in the L forms widget, and I don't know if this made it into the the SDC spec or not, but there was this idea of kind of leading text that would be, I don't know if it was under a, a header or something, but it would basically be a place to hang the actual question. And because effectively, if, if I think of it right, we need a term that, rep that, that can hang that question and maybe some, you know, help text or whatever. Um, and then underneath it, we have the, the long terms that would, would carry the result values uh, for, uh, for those. Um, but exactly how to do that in our data model. I don't know if we have all the right slots. We might. Yeah, I yeah. guess I'm still not clear. So in this situation, you would say 63512-8 would be used only to report the numeric, the number, the right. quantitative value. And then I choose not to answer. That we just would not represent. No, it goes it, it, in a message. It goes it goes into um, a different slot in the message that says why why don't I have data in this result? That's right. That's it's, exactly it's, right. It's, it's a global capability of both version two of HL seven and Fire. There's a place that you always put that stuff. Okay, so I need to have... look to see where that yeah. is yeah. so that yeah. we understand and can tell our users this is how you need to represent that. Right. So we can get by with just that single term in this instance. Yeah. We okay. And then in sort of preferred state, and then those exceptional values can be put into those other attributes when when the, the data is exchanged. Okay. So then in the second example, is that a use case where you're saying we should have a second link code yeah. to represent all shots? Yeah. Essentially the all shots is the one that's kind of mm -hmm. the yep. tipping point. Right. Because well, yeah. the issue we're having here is we have the override answer list. So there's an answer list associated with that code. But because of that, the L forms only shows that answer list now. It does not give you the option to put in that quantitative value. So we haven't, we're having an issue in L forms where it's like one, you only have, you can only do one or the other, essentially. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a tools bug. Yeah. So that's I, I kind of go back to them fixing their questions. Because all shots to me feels like a uh, a way of not really knowing how many shots you had or how many shots you were supposed to have. And that seems like a way to sort of circumnavigate the actual answer. But that's, we can't fix their questions for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you're right, but I don't think we can fix it. Uh, right. That's, that's yeah. all, all the person might know and so I, you know, I think you have to have it so that they can say that, you know, all shots, most of my shots, I mean, actually <laughs> you think you can think of some other answers that might be in that answer list, mm -hmm. but those answers should be, um, yeah, there should be a different LOINC code that would contain those answers that, that is separate, distinct from the LOINC code that contains the numeric count. So just, just to bring up the alternative proposal, it was to create an answer list with like one shot, two shots, three shots, all shots. No, don't do that. Oh, okay, do we, that. Did, we did not like that idea don't, don't either. Don't do that, so. patients won't know that. I mean, Stan's right. The problem is not the answer so much, it's the question. 
Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And, and, um, you know, people, um, you know, what, what Stan said earlier is exactly right. People might say, I had a few, but I don't remember how many I didn't mm -hmm. have. I, I, I might have had one, but I'm not sure. There's all kinds of, of ways of expressing fine gradations of, of, of inability to be precise. And whether they're important or not, um, uh, only needs to be captured by uh, a determination by the form's authors. So ultimately it becomes a question design problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe just to clarify, representing it as a categorical like ordinal. So even the number of family members saying one, one member, two members, three members, but Again, we felt like it was important. It was a quantitative concept, you know, quantitative value. So it was important to map it to a quantitative link code rather than right. trying to rework the term to be a nominal or a ordinal list of some kind. Yeah. So, right. to okay. fit well into our informatics structures, you need two questions for all these. You need, I know how many, or I'm not sure how many. Mm -hmm. And there's a set of qualitative answers for the I'm not sure that carries the gradations you need for what you're trying to get. And then you have a, a numeric quantitative value for the other one. But that, that makes things more lengthy, more tedious to fill out, more confusing, harder to document, and a lot of people don't like that approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and, and there's big challenges around decision support. I mean, two questions. Two, that's right. two, that's right. two terms with the same question with different answer lists. I, I, I mean, there's big issues around it. The solution might be worse than the problem. <laughs> Plotna has her hand raised. Oh, Plotna. sorry, Plotna. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Susan, exactly. Like I want to echo what you said because I'm concerned, you know, if we did create an ordinal term then to represent this concept, you know, you see the term up in the top left corner. So would it essentially be the same, like number of human papilloma vaccine uh, doses received, find, ord? But then we're going to basically have two terms that represent the same concept. Yeah, the same concept. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right, and that's a problem. Yes, exactly. I just I feel but, like but again, what this I mean. This, this question is, is about whether they've completed their their sequence or not. That's really what they're trying to ask, but they just worded the question wrong, which is different than how many shots did you receive? That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's true. But like, if you go back to the other one for the family members, let's say you know there's a similar answer list for that one. I mean, really, it's asking the number of people staying at this address, and it just I don't know. I just like it makes me very nervous if we decide to make a second code that represents that exact same concept but with an answer list yeah well this one i what what would be the other question in this case have you complete do you know if you have you know have some phrasing around have you completed your HPV oh no the next the next one i know but for for the number of people living at my address oh, oh that one yeah oh no, that... well okay but going back then to the hpv one then okay if you're suggesting, <laughs> no, supporting you, Stan. no, 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 I thought you were suggesting making another term that has a component number of human, you know, HPV doses received that's ordinal. Are you suggesting making a term that says, have you finished your vaccine series? Because then all shots doesn't make sense. As yeah, no, answer. no, no, we're stuck as Stan was saying, you gotta, you, you know, Question we're stuck with what they've got. Right. Um, and, and, and I think, <laughs> You know, I wouldn't make another thing that that is that one is again. You know, you have to pick one or the other. And so, you know, were the answers right? The question wrong, or is the question right? And the answers are wrong. <laughs> but yeah. so, so we're we got to decide which of those choices because we can't answer this question. We can't solve the problem without landing on one side of that fence or the other. Exactly and if right. you choose that the answers are right, which seem reasonable to to ask that question. Then the question's wrong and you're just going to have to either deal with the fact that they asked the question wrong and, you're, and people who look at it are going to figure that out when they look at the loud you know choices which is okay or do something much more dramatic i think uh, for this one yeah and, and again you, you know there's a very tight coupling with with l forms to 
what's in LOINC. In actual systems, you have greater flex flexibility. And so, you know, if the, the fact that you make a, a, a second LOINC code for, for the ordinal, you know, it, it might even be narrative instead of, or, or not narrative, but um, nominal. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't, I don't know if you could put them in order, but you might be able to. Uh, if you make that, it doesn't. You you could have the user interface basically look exactly like this does, but underneath that, basically, is if they if they type a number, uh, you put that into the into the quantitative result, and if they if they if they put any uh, any of these other choices, you put that into the nominal uh, line code. Uh, because then it's, you know, everything is strongly typed. Uh, and that, I mean, it, I guess the need for strong typing may be, uh, you know, that's a long conceptual discussion, but I certainly, certainly my bias is towards strongly typed systems because of how I want to use the data. If you, if you don't do that, then everybody who uses the data has to put the logic in that says, oh, if this is a number, then it means this. And if it's not a number, then it means that. And uh, and every single user has to do that. And, and so it's much, much better to put the data, to strongly type the data to start with. And then they can ask, you know, uh, both questions or, or they, they can, they realize that there's there, there are two ways that this could be answered and that, that they're not equally computable. You know, you, 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 can't, you can't calculate an average for all shots, uh, you know, whereas you could calculate the average number of shots people had received if they give you a real number. But yeah, from the LOINC perspective, again, what you, what you could do is, is put both of those questions into a, you know, into a two item panel and, uh, and then express that, this is a you know it's a it's an exclusive or situation you either answer one or the other of those two things and that's that's what you're going to get it isn't really what you're what you're really um uh, approaching and getting at here stan is um because of the nature of this kind of thing that either you do it um, in a very well formed, strongly typed way in the terminology and the underlying data to reduce the burden on the people using it, uh, or uh, and and um, uh, but then incur a burden on all the user interface developers to handle um, the problems of making it simpler for users and underneath the covers dealing with the strong typing because they're different representations. Or um, you make it easier for the user interface people, and they can just slap it together and throw it in one place, and then you put a burden on the users of the data to tease that apart downstream. I, I don't, I don't really see it as a uh, win lose. I see it as a choice as to where you want to put the extra burden on, because I, I don't see any way of making the burden go away. Looks like John Snyder has his hand raised. Yeah, I kind of want to build on Ted's statement there is uh, whether we want to decouple the input data type versus the transmission and the storage data type. Because if we back up to the number of people living in the household, if we leave that as an open string field, we're going to realistically in real world scenarios throw away 30 to 40 percent of our data because of typographical errors. Right. But if the input is restricted to an ordinal list and we're not dealing with an infinite number of answers in this answer list for this scenario, um, we're really tightening down the amount of usable data that we're actually capturing if we treat it as an ordinal, at least at point of capture. That's right. But you can, you can manage that. I, I mean, you can still, without making it an ordinal, the user interface can can require that a digit be typed there instead of a instead of other things. So you can you you, you can you can validate the entry without creating a pick list. Yeah. 
Yeah, but you still need a threshold of entry, Stan, where you have a minimum and maximum allowed value because that's where you run into your typographical yeah, errors. But, but, but that's part of the validation. I mean, you don't have to just say it's a number. You can say it has to be a number between this and this. Okay. Right. Right. So, so it's really, there's a piece of complexity that we have to deal with. And I guess from the fact that as part of developers of a reference terminology, um, our natural focus is on the people who aggregate and consume and analyze the data. Um, uh, but um, as John Snyder act, act, accurately, I think, uh, put it, um, uh, in order to um, have good data that goes in uh, to be most usable, um, uh, Stan's points about you need additional validation in the user interface side. Otherwise you haven't gotten anywhere, but gone in circles, I think are also absolutely valid. Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. So where does that bring us? So uh, if I were to summarize, first of all, you know the the reason that there is no answer that's that's universally uh, accounted for in the message structure. So you never make line codes for that. Right. Uh, we believe in strong typing, and so if you know my if if you can answer and and give a a quantitative answer, but it's also permissible to give other kinds of uh, categorical answers you need another loint code for the categorical thing and best practice would probably be to put both of those things into a a um, panel a panel mm -hmm. so that people see the association and you can say you know you, you only need to answer one of these yeah. uh, if you can tell me the number great if you can't then here's a list of things that you can tell me right so we can uh, we can make use of don't we, well, I don't know if we really want to go this far, but we don't we have the required with um, alternates uh, attribute in the panel. So you could you could actually signify that you'd sort of use one or the other of those two codes. Yeah, that's yeah. the yeah. I, I I forget the how strong our expression language is in there, but you, <laughs> basically you can say, you know, you make a panel and say uh, if uh, if A exists, then B can't exist. If B exists, then A can't exist. Uh, whatever. So we probably ought to make an example of that so that we can we can show people exactly how to do that. Right. Yeah, we, we've, we've always had this problem uh, or this issue that people can do one or the other. Um, there, there, are, there are use cases where people put in a qualitative and uh, a, a nominal that refines or sets certain things like um, uh, uh, degrees of accuracy, accuracy or something. In other words, to capture a person inputting um, five, I think, or was it six? I think it was five. Um, if it's important for a survey to capture that, that's a use case where you'd have to capture um, uh, uh, some kind of a nominal that says something descriptive about the quantitative value. Mm -hmm. So I think in most cases it would be an exclusive or, but I see use cases where you'd need both. But it'd be highly exceptional if we don't have really good, really clear examples, we're just gonna confuse the community. Okay, well, Renee, do you think, are you good with this? and? I think so. So we'd have in this particular instance, we'd have an HPV shots given or administered panel probably with two questions underneath with the, the A and B. Uh, you know, only being able to have one or the other answered. Yep. Yep. All right. And then for the other example of number of people living there. It's a numeric answer and flavor and all why it's null will be carried elsewhere in the message. Bingo. Yeah, flavors of null and other things are elsewhere in transmission formats and in any 
properly built analysis model that have to be captured elsewhere as well. Hey, Brene, can I make a, a small nit uh, suggestion on the, the term? I think you have the details display earlier. The short name, I think yeah. the abbreviation for number is like no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it looks like no people live here, something like that. <laughs> no people? Yeah. Or no people this address. Yeah, no people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I no think we have to review of all of our. <laughs> <laughs> so we might, we might want to save that one. Yeah, yeah. let's not add insult to injury on this question, huh? <laughs> Thank you. OK. So does that, that wraps up that topic, yes? I think so. All right. I'm good. So what's awesome. next on our agenda? Next, we have SDOH with questionnaires, choosing answer lists when there are multiple similar options. That is uh, Dr. Lau and Anil Patel. So are you ready? Hi. Hi there. Yeah. Um... I am assuming that I can share screen. Yes, you should be able to. Be able to. Perfect. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to bring the issues about uh, social determinants of health data standards here uh, for discussion at this particular committee. And um, uh, I'll try to be brief because I only have a few slides. Uh, we're still new at this, so if our questions seem too rudimentary, please just uh, bear with us. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of our data standard work on STOH uh, in Canada so that we can provide a Canadian context. I'll describe some of the issues that we have come across while working with the various terminology standards, including LOINT. And then I'll just summarize uh, the uh, issues that we've come across for discussion on the last slide. So over the years, uh, we've actually done quite a bit of work in Canada around uh, STOH and their impacts of uh, health of the Canadians. And one of the leaders in this area is Dr. Andrew Pindall from St. Michael Hospital uh, in uh, Toronto, Ontario. And in 2010, they've actually started collecting uh, social demographic data on all patients who sought care at the hospital as part of the routine process. And after an initial pilot, they identified 14 questions on a range of STOH that could be self-administered by patients uh, and um, through tablets, et cetera, uh, and uh, uploaded to EHR. And the work soon expanded to include a number of health organizations in Toronto. And, it, and now it's actually a multi-jurisdictional initiative in five provinces that continue to collect the social demographic data so that they can identify appropriate equity-oriented interventions. So the latest iteration of the questionnaire that is shown here is called SPARC. It, it uh, stands for Screening for Poverty and Related Social Determinants to Improve Knowledge of and Access to Resource Tool. There's still 14 questions, but the, uh, there have been many, many changes over the years to adapt them to the Canadian context. And like I said, the questionnaire is now being validated in five provinces. Today, this work has uh, generated quite a bit of attention from uh, different jurisdictions. So the next logical step would be to expand Spark across the country. And one way uh, that we're trying to make it happen is to form a SDOH working group to facilitate the discussion of this particular topic. And also specifically to explore ways that we can standardize SDOH. And, we do want to learn from the Gravity Project in the States that has uh, pretty well set the benchmark in terms of SCOH data standards in the field from what we can gather. So um, to do that, what we did was uh, we reviewed some of the earlier work done by the Gravity researchers, especially from the Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network or SIREN uh, and the PREPARE initiative, uh, which stand for the protocol for responding and assessing patient assets risks and experiences. So we want to leverage their work in, uh, in Canada here, especially in the area of standardized medical vocabularies for the STOH. So today we're here to uh, seek some uh, best practice advice guidance on the use of LOINT in STOH so we can apply them in Canada. And to facilitate this uh, discussion, I'm going to try to use uh, race and ethnicity as the examples to guide our discussion. 
So if, if you look at the work done on prepare, it's quite impressive as there are already loin codes and answer codes created for all the questions. And using race as the example, you can see the loin codes are available with their answers. But when we started uh, using uh, the uh, uh, loin codes to start encoding the Spark questions and answers, one question that came up is, well, which loin code do we use since there are so many to choose from? If you look at the race example, there are many. And uh, what's even more confusing to us is that some of the uh, answers, while the uh, narrative may well be the same as far as one can tell, they have a different answer ID. Um, so then the, the question is, well, which one should we be choosing here? Then another question is whether we should in fact use Loin or SNOMED for the answers, because we're trying to follow the guiding principles of using Loin for questions and SNOMED for answers. So what should we be doing? And also the reason to possibly consider SNOMED as the answers are that we can use a value set from the core terminology and take advantage of the built-in hierarchies that may be quite useful when we need to aggregate the detailed codes or answers into fewer categories for the population level analysis. And if you look at the uh, March 2019 Prepare Implementation Action Toolkit document, the SDOH questions have been expanded to what action should be done. In fact, in chapter nine of this document called Acting on Data, there's a detailed explanation of a wide range of screening, assessment, diagnosis, and treatment and intervention uh, actions available. And the SIREN researchers have also created a companion document with all the available uh, LOIN, ICD, SNOMED, and uh, CPT code options. So with these additional questions and response options, they're starting to look like laboratory panels where you have batteries of tests with uh, possibly multiple layers of responses with all kinds of predefined details and rules. So this raises even more questions on the need for subtypes, uh, hierarchies, cross maps, value sets, and decision mapping rules that may go beyond LOIN. And going back to using the race as the example, we need to select the appropriate LOIN code and then also start to think about the appropriate screening, assessment, diagnosis, intervention, and treatment codes because um, uh, they can come from different terminologies such as uh, SNOMED and ICD. So, Here's a summary of the issue then, so we can uh, discuss that. I've used uh, Prepare and Spark to illustrate the different types of uh, SDOH questionnaires being used in the States and in Canada. I raised a number of issues and questions for discussion. First is which loin code should we be using in Spark? The second is should we use SNOMED for answers in Spark? And the third is, well, how do we deal with uh, these screening, assessment, treatment related questions and actions with respect to terminology choices? Do we stick with LOIN or do we now have to expand to uh, SNOMED and other codes as uh, what the um, uh, SIREN researchers have, have started to do? And the question on which terminologies is especially relevant when it may involve subtypes, maps, value sets and rules, which we may have to uh, want to do with the Spark questionnaire and all these issues bring me to the overall question for the LOIN committee, which is what's, the, what's your best practice guidance recommendations for Canada, because we're embarking on this SDOH journey now. Thank you, that's all I have. So do you have the rest of the weekend to discuss? <laughs> <laughs> Only the weekend? <laughs> Actually, this is, this is a great presentation. Thank you very much, because this highlights a whole collection of interesting challenges. Uh, my question, since you're based in Canada, um, is uh, I, 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 I don't know how broad it is in the SDOH area, but I know in some of the particular points you're using, um, such as the race and ethnicity codes here, um, it was my understanding that Canada Health InfoAway um, has a bunch of uh, recommendations for the different provinces um, for what terminologies are preferred to be used um, for what kinds of things. Um, I know there's a strong preference for SNOMED for a lot of things, but as I'm not actually Canadian, um, I, I'm, you know, I apologize. I don't actually know what the recommendations for race and ethnicity is in Canada. Um, the codes that you see in the gravity project, the LA codes, um, uh, the widely used race and ethnicity codes in, um, in the US 
um, were developed over a number of years um, by the CDC for public health surveillance. And it's published, uh, there's some 300 or so of them. Um, but as you might imagine, um, their focus and their detail areas are on things um, uh, sp very particular uh, south of your border. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, it doesn't have the kind of granularity for uh, some of, especially um, uh, some of the indigenous peoples that uh, divisions that you have in Canada that don't exist in the US and the continental United States. Um, but there, so there's a whole collection of things around race and ethnicity. It's a, it's a great topic to ex explore, great example to explore the broader issues. Um, but that one in particular, I think has a special set of rules that may already have some some things out of uh, um, uh, 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 County Health Infoway and and some of the, uh, the some of the standards bodies there. Um, if I may uh, respond to that, um, you're quite correct in saying that yes, Canada Health Infoway has provided uh, some sort of the uh, guidance in terms of the terminologies, and, and they're fairly typical. Snowmed and LOIN and ICD were appropriate, and then we have our own sort of a drug code, but um, you know instead of RF norm. Uh, but, but those are sort of the fairly standard one. With respect to race and ethnicity, um, this is where um, Andrew Pindle is actually leading the country because it, what you see here on the screen uh, with respect to the, uh, the different races, um, the uh, Canadian Institute for Health Information actually has adopted that as the national interim standard um, because uh, through, through many iterations, they have come, arrived at this sort of a set of values that seem to be most um, applicable to the Canadian setting. So right. this is going to be the standard, in fact. But right now, there, there's no uh, particular uh, coding scheme for it. Like sure. it's not either in SNOMED or anything. They're just a set of these uh, values set terms that you see. Does that help? Yeah, it, it actually does. So I'll ask Stan and Dan and others, um, uh, is, is this kind of thing where the existing LA codes um, uh, clearly were created for the strong needs in a particular jurisdiction um, may be insufficient um, for other jurisdictions that um, want to use LOINC for certain questions and need additional answers. Um, is this the kind of candidate that we would, um, uh, uh, we would absolutely consider to add LA codes? I, and I'm asking, I, I, I don't know. No what our best so, practices would be. Ted, this is Susan. I mean, we see this not in the nursing domain, not as much for dur jurisdiction, but for specialty. You know, okay. some specialties okay. want different answers versus other specialties, um, like wound types. They may not want them all. Um, and that way it's just an extensional list and they can constrain it. So, um, and not normative. That's part of the issues here is things are, are normative because they want to have that exact list. And so you end up having a whole bunch of normative point codes. All right, so there's a bunch of stuff right. going on here. So when you're constraining a larger list, such as SNOMED CT is probably the biggest list of all, um, we have some pretty well-developed and fairly well-documented mature machinery, you know, value sets, standardized normative value set bindings and um, you know, specific normative uh, answer lists that are rather than just suggestions and loink. Um, we have a number of techniques to deal with constraints. Um, when people have things that are really particular for their specialty, their jurisdiction, their practice, their whatever, the area that they're going into knew that the coded concepts don't exist in existing um, infrastructure reference sets. Um, uh, then I think the problem is subtly different. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm misspeaking here, any, any of the committee members, um, but I, I perceive it as a little bit different than the constraint problem, which we've, we've worked pretty much, pretty much beaten, beaten the dead horse for many, many years on because it's such a critical piece of what we do. So, so we, another... yeah, we have some hands raised. Um, Stan, if you wanna go ahead and then we'll take the hands. Okay. Uh, another approach is to um, 
to really recognize the role of implementation guides as opposed to the, the strict rules of the terminology. Exactly. So from, from a semantics point of view, for instance, as, as long as, you know, if you have a question, then, and, and the answers that are in the answer list are semantically correct uh, with the intent of the question, uh, you can, you know, you can sort of slowly grow the list if people think of other reasonable answers that should come there. And then what happens though in the implementation guide is if you say, okay, I'm in, I'm in Canada and, and of that set of things, I only want these five. That's in your implementation guide, but the LOINC code is the same. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you basically could have uh, subsets and I guess you could say proper subsets of the, the LOINC answers uh, one subset used in Canada, one set used, sub, used in the US, and that's documented in the implementation guide so that then people, you know, people who then, uh, for instance, were looking at data from Canada and the US from an analytical point of view, you would have a single LOINC code and the answers would always be there. But you would know that certain answers could never come from Canada and certain answers could never come from the US because they have different uh, legal requirements around that. So that's another approach. Is, and, and I like that better than, I think you, you don't want to proliferate uh, different questions based on the answer list unless they're semantically different. That's right. That's but exactly. that's, I mean, that's just an opinion. So. No, I think it's right. Uh, you might be ask a, a question to follow up on that because um, using the answer list is what we initially started to do but then we were thinking if we do have to try to aggregate some of the uh, the answers for high level you know reporting aggregated reporting um, maybe we, we just don't know enough about the answer list because those codes um i i think they're sort of more like a flat list so how do we deal with that that's where, where so, we started so thinking they, about yeah you, well i guess it goes back to your other question i mean these so the, the right answer is all of these answers should come from, from SNOMED. They should be in the SNOMED ontology. And so you don't, you don't try and enforce the hierarchy in the, in the answer list, but you just, you, you take the concepts and you refer to the SNOMED ontology to, you know, if you're trying to do inferencing, you know, if, if you did something, uh, you know, you wanted to say that, um, I'm not sure what, this example doesn't work perfectly, but you can imagine, for instance, you were asking race and rather than this uh, small set of things, you you wanted to, uh, uh, you wanted to further, further define uh, which Native American nation they came from. You would be able to roll those up to say, all of these are uh, indigenous people, but you would do that in SNOMED, not that that's that's for part of the division of labor, if you will, between SNOMED and LOINC. LOINC. LOINC is is the questions and the answers, but if you want to reason about the answers and 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 ask about the relationships or ontologies or hierarchies, that should be done in SNOMED. If you don't mind me asking a follow up on that, does that mean we need to maintain two answer lists? Then? Because uh, you know, just looking at that uh, question three and Spark. There's a, a list of the uh, answers uh, that can be handled through the answer list in, within LOINC. But then we do want to roll up, let's say, all, all the Asians, you know, without the breaking them down or the indigenous. Does that mean that we have to also have another answer set that's in SNOMED, the value set? So I don't understand the question yet. Could you just, oh, I'm sorry. a little slow. Um, so. Okay. So question three, if you can see on the screen, um, uh -huh. th th those are the actual uh, answers of, uh, that's available. And the LOINT answer this actually contain these codes. So that, that's fine, we can use that. But if I understand you correctly, you're saying if we want to do reasoning, such as rolling up the different types of indigenous uh, or, or the Asian, um, then we should go to SNOMED. Does that mean that we now have to, for that question, we have to have two sets of answers one set is coming from the LOIN answer list and another set coming from the SNOMED uh, sort of a value set? No. Uh, in, in, uh, I, again, what you would, you know, these, these things represent concepts. And well, that, I'm, I'm lying a little bit because the, the LOIN, 
the link answers aren't strictly coded. They're actually just strings. But ignoring that, <laughs> uh, you know, there should be black in SNOMED, and you, and you just know that uh, the, the LOINC answer code is equivalent to the SNOMED code. And so uh, you, you would really just have one answer list, but for each answer in that list, there should be a corresponding, uh, I think there's a place to put the SNOMED, the SNOMED mapping if it exists, right? Somebody correct me about the, yeah, how you, you represent Yeah, you need to have a cross map then for the values. Uh, well, the, the I, I think the cross map is actually in LOINC. If if it's been mapped to SNOMED, then it's actually part of the part of the LOINC answer. I think is right. is a mapping to SNOMED. And we actually published that. Sorry to jump in. I know there's raised hands, so I just wanted to answer that. Oh, I'm glad so, you jumped in. <laughs> Save me. <laughs> so yeah, so we published those relationships um, in our answer file. So it's uh, basically a link between the answer string and the SNOMED code. And that's a work in progress. You know, we have um, many strings mapped, but there's, you know, even more that aren't mapped yet. But if you supply us with the mapping, then we can add it. And then that basically becomes part of the file. And you can also see those when you're looking at the details pages. Um, you can actually see those uh, SNOMED codes as well. And so what we usually recommend is if you're in... Um, you know, a country or jurisdiction where you can use SNOMED, then we recommend using the SNOMED codes. And then otherwise, you know, if you're not, then you can use the LA codes or the link answer string codes. And I have more okay. to say, but I'm going to wait my turn. Can I, yeah, uh, can I, can I get in? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being patient. <laughs> I am being patient. Yes. Um, following in Dan's footsteps. The, so, so there, you guys have kind of gone through a lot of different things. I think um, first I wanted to say, so the US and its approach to race and ethnicity is um, a tar pit that is, I would suggest not a model for any other country to try and align with. So um, that's number one. Number two, um, there's a, a lot, as I'm sure you found, Link codes that represent the question of what is your race or ethnicity or combined. And, um, and for, I have kind of gone through all of them, but there are specified things based on the census and OMB that in the US, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say this kind of air quotey, but uh, you must use, right? That is the expectation. And so for those sorts of things, I would expect, and it's so far as I can tell, Link does this, those would be normative. And those, um, those Link, uh, you know, questions, those they're really kind of survey identifiers, uh, need to be clear that they are the US OMB CDC, um, question that has this very specific set of answers that you're allowed or expected to use and that to use them in any other jurisdiction would be um well certainly something you could do but i wouldn't choose to do it unless it just absolutely fit what you needed because you are therefore recording the set of things that the u.s defines as what you should record and and they are a hierarchy those are yeah, and then but you're showing the LOINC representation of that, which I, I'm a little dismayed that that LOINC has chosen to do this. But these are not the codes to represent the answers that anyone should ever communicate. They are the things that uh, that are expected. This is true in Fire. It's in true. It's true in HL7. It's true in and um, and any information you collect and then have to submit uh, based on you know the fact that you vaccinated somebody or anything else, that information that you're expected to submit are based on what are called the CDC race and ethnicity code system, and those are the codes that you are expected to submit. Now you know this isn't like Blink did something terrible. We we do do this, and and you know like Swapna noted. You, I hope, I actually don't know, but these should be mapped to the actual codes that that particular very constrained way of viewing the world, i.e., you know, race is a thing that's got 
hundreds of answers and ethnicity has a thing that has only a couple. Um, but that being said, that's the way we do it in the US. So I think if you were saying, okay, well, we wanna align with that and we need to do it, in, you know, do this in Canada, I, I would strongly encourage you to not follow the US approach, but if that turned out that's what the jurisdictions kind of say there's an alignment with, then it, it one, I would agree that in your context, you could probably still use the survey identifier for race or ethnicity. And there's another one that's different for both together. And then take a subset that if those set of codes that align with what you need are only a subset, that's fine. You wouldn't say that you're reporting OMB race and ethnicity because you're not, because there's some very strict rules about how that sort of stuff happens. But you could certainly do that. If it turns out that the, you know, the issue is that you don't have, I mean, you know, like there's some of the, obviously some of the Native American tribe or the Canadian Native North American tribes are not listed. And so you need to put those in. So the question is, where do you get them? I would suggest that, you know, it's the same old problem that you always have, which is in your context, you're now not using it as a normative thing. And so I think part of the question you're asking is, is that, well, if the set of codes that I need are 90% there, and I'm going to take the general same approach, can I use that LOINC code to represent the survey? Can I take all of these LOINC answers that are the ones that I want? And then since it's normative, because you might be picking from one where that's a normative list, can I pick other ones and put them in, whether those come from SNOMED or some other code system? And I think that's a good question because we've run into that in the past and I've always felt like I don't feel like I know the exact answer that Link confidently wants to get people to agree to, i.e. you got a normative list. If you're not using the normative list, you're not, you're not compliant. If you wanted to ask those questions but only want to use part of the available answers, you have to pick something else. I, I think what we've tended to say is it's not that strict, but I'd like to hear the committee's position on that. And then the last thing that I just want to say, because there was a part of this was the whole LOINC question, SNOMED CT answer thing. And I think that we say, I mean, I my understanding is we say that because we want it to be true wherever it's possible that it can be true. But here's a good example where, um, you know, without kind of getting into why do we make LOINC answers for all the things that we actually have CDC codes for, I think that was old history. And, um, but it would be, no, I wouldn't pick SNOMED CT to represent all these things that literally in the US you're expected to give CDC codes for. So it's not always SNOMED CT is the answer. It's just that when you don't have anything else, but you find what you want in SNOMED, you should absolutely pick SNOMED over anything else. So I'll, and I'll be quiet. Yeah, I think, I think you're right on, Rob. That's why I answer, asked the question uh, up front about uh, what Canada Health InfoWay and your, your national uh, bodies that make these rules had said. Thank you, that's very helpful. Swapna, did you still have something you wanted to add? Yeah, actually, so I have several things to add, <laughs> if I may. So just to respond from the LOINC perspective, so I'm, you know, I'm glad you have this slide up. So basically the way it used to be in LOINC was that anytime there was a normative answer list coming from some place, we would make a new code, even if the concept was the same. And that's why you see so many race codes and the you know, race and ethnicity, and you see that in several places. But then a few years ago, we actually developed a mechanism to add override answer lists exactly so that this wouldn't happen, so that we would have one single LOINC code for race, but with the ability in the context of different panels to be able to attach whichever list was relevant to that jurisdiction or survey or what have you. And so over time, we've been trying to discourage sort of like the duplicates and you know encourage the use of a single code. So for race, I would absolutely recommend using the 32624-9 and not any of the other ones. Um, and then in the context of the Spark panel, we would be able to attach exactly your answer list 
to that code so that you would see exactly those uh, LA codes. And Rob, you're exactly right. So SNOMED in general, but then we actually, at least in one of these lists, we do have the CDC uh, race codes attached. Um, you just can't see them in this view, but if you look at the details page, you can actually see them. They look very much like point codes, actually. <laughs> yeah, and you also have links out too. So there's been a lot yes. of improvement in this the, right. from before. Exactly. And so, yeah, so I think, you know, just keeping that in mind and, you know, we obviously still have work to do in this area, same with, you know, sex and gender. I think we still have a lot of codes that have these normative answer lists attached to them. But what we've been trying to do is in the context of the term by itself, just have an example answer list. So hopefully this race term just has an example list um, if you're just looking at the details. And then in the context of various panels, they might have normative lists, but by itself, you can basically use it with any answers uh, that you need. May I ask a quick follow-up on that answer list? So you. Do I understand you correctly that um, you know if we use that race code that's at the top uh, row there, um, it, it, there are some of these answers that are, occur in uh, different lists. Are you saying we shouldn't sort of uh, just pick and pick them from multiple lists, but create our own sort of a set of answer lists and call that our own normative list? Right. So when you were showing the Spark survey, so that question yep. was it number three? Yep. I think so. If that is a normative list for yep. your purpose, then we would be able to create a link answer list that has the answer strings corresponding to those 10 answers that are in your list. But some of those, they're actually from your existing answer ID. Oh, okay. right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So okay. we would, yeah, we would reuse the IDs. And I was a little bit dismayed to see, you know, the previous slide that had duplicate LA, or not duplicate, but different LA codes for the same, um, you know, for the same yes. uh, races. So we need to yes, definitely go back and, and look for that. Okay. Um, that shouldn't happen. Um, okay. but anyway, but yeah, you're exactly right. So where, you know, it would be that we reuse the LA codes across different answer lists. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions and we also have John and Stan. I'm going to get to these couple of questions and then we'll come back to Stan and John. Um, does the answer code list LL247-8 refer to the original systems list? That's Gregory. And then there's a follow-up from Gregory. Um, who wants to take that? I'm not sure what you mean by the original systems list. Well, let's see if we can, let me bring up his other question while we find him and un unmute him. Yeah. Answer can you hear me now? Yes, yes, go ahead. Perfect. No, I was just I was just pointing out because he has the for the four six four six three dash six. Uh I, I looked that up and got the answer list that he has listed there, but it did not really specify where the originating system for that list was. But when you mentioned that he should be using the three two six four the uh, three two six two four dash nine, that answer list does specify that it's the OMB nineteen ninety seven race categories plus unknown so it but, it, but again that you know <laughs> that's specific to what the in the u.s and the correct OMB census process and it's defined that's the important thing is that it's right. defined the list is defined where and I've that's been just the source of the answer list and so it's a little bit confusing when you're looking at the details pages because in a lot of places you'll see reagan street is the source um, so it's it, it's not that you can only use it for OMB. It's just that we got the answers from the OMB list. But at least it gives you a place to go look for the definition of that list or the definition yeah. of the items of that list. And that's where I think a lot of this structuring has has kind of gone sideways is that we've lost the definitions for the the data items. And so nobody knows quite how to map it because the definition got lost somewhere in the mix. Right, and 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 those those race codes in particular are um, hierarchical, and um, and so you know so you can call that the definitional aspect of that. So you need to look at the entire hierarchy in order to kind of know what they mean. Um, similarly, well, so it's one entire code system that has two top roots, right? So the one top root is race, the other is ethnicity. 
And, um, and they've actually been playing with polling codes in to the ethnicity side, which used to be simply um, Hispanic or Latino or other. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> um, and so now they've, they've kind of, they've played with that some. So they pull from this one big list and they've added to that list over time too. I don't know if they've moved things out of what was, for example, Asian, you know, which is a top is higher and then there's other things underneath it. So they, they, they've played with this thing and it's solely built upon the desires around. Um, it's census. more politically motivated. It's than it absolutely is. politically motivated. Mm -hmm. So and just be really careful. Data. Oh yeah. Um, I've been caught up in this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sam, you had your so, hand up? Yeah. Um, a lot of what we've been talking about is sort of how you define this at design time. And I'm just thinking about when you send the data, you want to be able, so, you know, according to, to what, what we're designing here, you know, we would have our current best strategy, recognizing that what we have on the screen doesn't reflect that completely. But, you know, as long as things are the same semantic question, then you could have different answer lists that you can attach to that depending on where you are in the context of what you're doing. Once that's done, and then you're going to send the data to somebody else, you'd like to contain with the data what the constraint was. That is, was this an OMB list? Was this the Canada, you know, uh, uh, uniform Canada representation for this? Was this the representation in Mexico or uh, wherever? Uh, and I, I saw it as synon you know, similar to, if you will, sort of, uh, in lab link when you associate a methodology with it or in open EHR, it's a, uh, uh, a protocol, quote unquote. Uh, and so I, I want to think about that a little more, but thought I'd plant a seed because I think, I think there would be easy ways to, uh, to, to keep with the data, uh, which, which answer list you used, you know, which answer list was in force when you entered the data so that people who are doing analysis across data could ask questions, oh, well, you know, this answer is never going to show up in the US because it's not part of the answer list, whereas it is part of the answer list in, in Canada. And, and that would be obvious in the data, not just in the, uh, because after the data is collected, if you don't do that, then you'll have to go through a lot. You have to make a lot of assumptions uh, in order to determine how this was done. So, well, that's part of the reason why they encourage um, in many of the data types to, uh, in addition to the code system for a coded concept, to um, to identify the value set that it was part of when it was captured. Yeah, for precisely that reason. Yeah. Mm. That's helpful. Thank you. Does that mean I'm up? Oh, uh, yeah, John's up. Sorry, I was speaking and no one heard me. <laughs> well, that's okay. Hey, Dr. Lau, if we could roll forward to the next slide where the Spark survey, I kind of have to change hats here and speak from the SNOMED US national release perspective. Um, a couple of the terms that we're looking at here, like the East slash Southeast Asian and the indigenous from an editorial policy perspective are gonna be considered um, ambiguous. Um, now they may be allowed within the Canadian extension um, but those specific terms may need to be reevaluated for granularity uh, in order to be accepted into either the Canadian extension or into the international edition if you choose to go the route of SNOMED. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, we do have lots of um, questions with answers that are like that, you know, where you have a slash either or. I mean, if you look at question 10, one of the responses here, 
again, you know, social housing slash subsidized housing slash rented, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. We have many of those, so we have to break them up. That's another one of those ones that I prefer not to answer thing that we <laughs> we talked about earlier. <laughs> The theories of these, the the theory of these things are so so easy until you go out into the real world. <laughs> yeah, it's so many okay. interesting. I I'm not sure where to raise my hand. Can I put put in, in the queue? In the in the participants thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, panelists can um, just yeah you can. You should be able to raise your hand, but that's okay. Go ahead, Susan. Well, I I thought where Stan was going, and he and he had a really good point, is we're going to have all these different codes for race and all these different codes for ethnicity, and how do that we compare them across? Because they're not the they should be interoperable, but the, some of the values in the value sets are not. And so, do we want to make a master? race and ethnicity that has them all that is the parent kind of like what he was saying with you know methodless um systolic blood pressure as the parent of systolic on the brachial artery you know how do we make it so that we're interoperable at at the higher level well, I, I'll, I'll jump up and say one one thing obviously mapping you know the, the some of the details is part of the solution but but i just want to tell you first off i have no idea what, what race and ethnicity means <laughs> mm -hmm. um i certainly can't tell you what ethnicity means as compared to race um, and and i would challenge anybody in a large room to try and defend their their opinion but um so that's one problem and the other is that uh, you know then start talking about what does it mean to be Latino? What does it mean to be South Asian? I mean, these are constructs that are so socially dependent. I mean, I, th th I'm not saying that it is foolish to do what the OMB and, and what we need to do in terms of a good census, but we just have to realize that, uh, you know, like so many other things, this one is really kind of dependent on whoever the person is who puts together the list and the person who asks the questions and how that person who's answering them feels that day. And if all of that stuff is okay with you, then then great, and, and it could be okay. But but to, to kind of say that we know what a black person is or who a, you know, a, a South Asian person is, is, oh boy. Exactly. <laughs> Sounds <Thank> dangerous <laughs> to me. <laughs> I, yeah, that is definitely a difficult concept. Um, let me turn back over quickly to um, Dr. Loud. Do you have the guidance that you were seeking? Have we answered your question? I, generally, yes. <laughs> I have a long list of things that I've been uh, tracking. So, so thank you very much for that. Is there sort of a best practice guide of uh, some sort that, that we can get our hands on related to this whole area of uh, you know selecting the right code and all that? Maybe I just missed it. I've been trying to look for some of the, those guidance topic this week i don't think we really have anything for this for the like the survey slash clinical area so much you know we've been working on implementation guides for lab link um but i mean i think it would be extremely useful if we were to write one for this area as well you know we have well, some I know we need one in canada yeah no oh, just oh, you know when you said that it just, guide yeah, exactly. Just because there's so much intricacy and we've been making changes over the last few years and, you know, we, like we've been talking about it, but really, we really need to be able to disseminate that information. Um, so maybe we can take it offline because I certainly would like to get, you know, have some more dialogue about that and, and to see whether we can get, get some more guidance. So yeah, absolutely. That. that would be great. Okay, so um, we're we have about 20 minutes left in our meeting and we do have a couple of um, uh, committee updates that we wanna to turn to. So hopefully um, we can finish that conversation offline and thank you everybody. That was really um, engaging.
um, lots of great input. Uh, and so I will now, sorry, I'm sort of hijacking from you, Ted and Stan. I apologize for that. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> and we can hand over to the Document Ontology Subcommittee update. Okay, I can start that off. Um, thank you for that. So now that we've um, covered some of the issues in clinical LOINC, we're at the point where we're going to present basically updates of uh, things that have been already decided, we think, um, we hope. Um, and, you know, we'll, we're going to review the activity over the past six months um, in the Document Ontology Subcommittee meetings, which meet uh, monthly. Um, so let's begin. The, the first announcement is that we have our new Document Ontology Subcommittee Chair, Rob McClure. David, um, are you sharing anything? Uh, I was thinking I was sharing, but I guess <laughs> once more, I didn't push the final. Push the button. button. Yep, there we go, okay. Great, okay, so here we are. I didn't Got it. say a whole lot. So the first line is, um, um, so Rob has uh, stepped up to be our chair. And, um, you know, want to thank him for that. And so with that, I will just turn over that first section to him. And Rob, whenever you feel like you want me to get back back on, just uh, let me know. I, I can continue to keep my slides up if that's what you Yeah, mean. no, that's great. Because then I can read what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> like, like all the other chairs, I'm totally dependent on the LOINC staff. Um, so, <laughs> um, and my role is uh, is actually pretty uh, ceremonial. And I just get, my voice gets to hurt, be heard for first, <laughs> which for anyone who knows me is probably not a big stretch. But, um, but in any case, I appreciate and, and I'm happy to stand up as the, the new subcommittee chair. I actually think this area is obviously pretty important and we are dependent on it uh, for the CCA work. And I uh, the, would ask that anyone who's interested in spending a little bit of time um, addressing the kinds of documents and how we identify those documents, we characterize maybe even a better word, um, to join us in that subcommittee. We could use um, more participation, although we do have good participation right now. We have, certainly need more participation. And, and in particular, I think as we uh, begin to work on what's in a sense, a sense this next bullet, um, you know, we've used Al to begin to investigate uh, how the document ontology aligns and what it kind of says about its components. Part of the struggles that the, the, the subcommittee has every time is uh, things like, is that a place of service or is it a type of service? Uh, you know, is it, what's important in the context of deciding that? Um, this gets to the value, like all of us, of having true implementers in our in our meetings, so that we can understand how these things get used. And I'll, I'll guess I'll close by saying that um, one of the things that I'm pushing David and and kind of the rest of us to think about, and he alluded to this when he talked about the value set group, which all the different ways that we group things in Loink. Um, I'm, I'm one of my goals is to try and look at that and figure out how do we use these different grouping mechanisms in LOINC, uh, particularly around co uh, clinical content, and, um, and try and harmonize that. So I'd be very encouraged in having people show up to the subcommittee and help us uh, tackle that. And we would encourage folks to grab that OWL file and play with it. And I'm going to make David do everything else. So go away, go, go, go for it, David. <laughs> okay, so let's see. I am going to review basically the changes and additions to the ontology and uh, documents during the past um, uh, period since our last meeting. Um, so the version 2.69, which was the December 2020 release contain 3,147 long terms, which is an increase of 124 over the June 2020 release. Uh, during that period, we also added three new um, parts to the ontology, three new values. Um, 
uh, strange that there's three when I'm actually, well, actually I know why there's three. Uh, we'll get to that. So here are the axis values that were added in version 2.69. Uh, there was one kind of document added, the Adrenal Insufficiency Emergency Action Plan. Um, there was a new type of service, gaps in care, uh, that was added to the, as a type of service uh, to support the creation of, of new documentation in that area. Uh, an additional quality node was added as a top level to um, encompass gaps in care and any other quality related uh, service types in the document ontology that may uh, come along. Uh, in the subject matter domain axis under multi-specialty, we added breastfeeding as a new subject matter domain. Uh, looking at the actual fully specified clinical documents uh, that we worked on and created, added or edited during this time, I think these are just new ones actually created, there was a set of evaluation notes that were either recreated from older ones that were previously uh, deprecated or new ones added in response to needs of CHI. There was 65. There was a set of allergy and immunology notes. There was a set of breastfeeding notes. There were various notes from the VA, various notes from Children's Minnesota and CHI. There was a set of photographic image documents from EPIC, um, three of those. Um, interesting. Uh, this gaps in care report. Again, we had to create a new type of service to support that. Um, and again, the adrenal insufficiency emergency action plan uh, for which we created this kind of document. Uh, let's see what else we have. So just updates um, based on committee subcommittee decisions. This, some of this covers what we just discussed, um, which we don't need to cover. Um, we already talked about the gaps in care under quality. Um, we already talked about breastfeeding. We talked about the kind of document. So this was an interesting decision uh, that was made. Loin code 34133-9, summary of episode note has been established in HL7 documentation as a static code and has had long-term use for the CCDA uh, template. Um, and what came up was the word Episode was feared to imply a single encounter, whereas the CCG document for which many have been stored, reported under this LOIN code is actually not representative of a single episode of care, but actually a period of time. And after considerable discussion over several meetings, uh, which included some proposals to create new access values and new LOIN terms, um, confusing the prior use of this code, but nevertheless, uh, the decision was finally made to continue with this code as an acceptable mapping for CCDA. And we uh, kind of established the definition um, applied to the part and as well as the loink term for episode of care to actually be defined as a provision of care over a spe specified period of time rather than a single encounter, which you know we, we felt would be the best option so that this code can, could continue to be, u, be used. Um, so COVID-19 documents. Well, this uh, if yes, I may sorry. jump in right there, just to kind of defend that even more, because um, mm -hmm. this is always a point of some controversy, I think. And, and, and I would say that, that that last sentence that essentially describes, you know, let's say a definition um, is not far afield from where the community, I think, has landed outside of LOINC too, that episodes can, that, that the idea of an encounter is a discrete interaction and that uh, episode therefore can, can um, encompass multiple encounters. And therefore it is reasonable to think of an episode as being a hospitalization. So, uh, so we didn't we didn't really break new ground in many respects. I don't think um, we just kind of put our stick firmly in the ground there. Right. Okay. Agreed. Yeah. So, just to review some document co related to COVID nineteen, um, you know, this was way back last time. We've um, there were telehealth documents created, and as well as those uh, previously existing, um, to cover the rise in the use of telehealth documents during the pandemic. Uh, 
there were 15, originally 15 spe COVID specific documents created. Um, then in version 2.69, there were two additional telehealth documents, uh, pretty low activity for additions because I guess we covered it with a lot of this. And now pre-release, um, since version 2.69, we, we have six new COVID-19 specific documents created already in the pre-release. So ongoing work, um, uh, we're looking at some questions about stroke prevention as a type of service. There's some ongoing questions about um, modeling notifications. There's uh, some issues surrounding growth charts, um, emergency department as a setting versus emergency medicine as a subject matter domain. We've already had a discussion about that, but I think we haven't fully uh, arrived at the conclusion for that um, or haven't certainly encoded it yet. Um, and there are of course, continual requests for new codes and continued distribution of the OWL file format. And as Rob mentioned at the beginning in his um, intro part, um, you know, I, I presented this in the lab committee meeting and I know there's a lot of overlap in, in members, membership and attendance at both of these meetings. So I don't need to go through the whole thing again, but we do have that new work, work group uh, covering uh, value sets. And um, that I think is an, an important part. We're gonna be looking at LOINC um, you know, panels, groups, hierarchies, ontologies, uh, what kinds of things in LOINC need grouping and which of those mechanisms is best to group them and come up to a, come up to a, to a conclusion with how to model these things in LOINC in a, in a consistent way. So anyway, that's what that work group is for. Not that it's different from this work uh, subcommittee, but if you're interested in that, um, please, uh, you know, meetings at LOINC.org or one of our communication channels and let us know your interest. Interesting. Yeah, I might add to the, you know, I think this probably happens in, uh, well, certainly the, the need to use LOINC, I'll just, I'm going to use this general phrase, attributes, um, to identify LOINC codes that all belong in a value set of, of some use is obviously important um, throughout all of LOINC. But um, we get a lot of questions in the document ontology group. Um, most recently, literally last week, um, where the, there's a desire to figure out how do I group a series of documents so that I can properly identify that they're all a kind of this document because I'm looking for one of those documents and there's more subtypes that, that I have to kind of collect together. And I have to tell you, we struggle with these, uh, to answer these questions a lot of times because of the variability and specificity um, that we properly have avoided um, in terms of, you know, trying to avoid the combinatorial explosion problem. And, um, and yet, uh, and then using some of those attributes of documents to, to kind of distinguish in particular inpatient outpatient was the last question. So again, I, I, I think it would, we would benefit from, particularly from folks who are implementing and using Blank codes represent documents to come to our meetings to help us figure out some of this stuff because we're going to be addressing some hard questions in the upcoming months. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank oh. you, Rob. Um, any questions or comments? Uh, we have a um, comment from Gregory Militsky that I'm responding to. He would like to be involved in the uh, ED setting versus subject matter. That's his clinical specialty. Um, Gregory, I'm sending you a message to um, complete a committee member application so you can join that committee and um, definitely bring your expertise to that. And so with definitely, that, thanks. yeah, thank you. With, Great. Certainly. Um, with that, we need to give some time to nursing. Um, I know that you guys had asked for about 15 minutes. We can go a few minutes over. So sorry to have cut you so short. But Susan yeah, and Lisa, I, do I like don't to think go? I'm going to go over. Um, oh. I hope not anyway. <laughs> Excellent. So um, uh, for any of you that want to know how to dress up a sweat jacket, just throw on a scarf, all you men. Um, <laughs> so I'm Susan Matney. Let me start my slideshow. I am one of the co-chairs of the Nursing Loic Subcommittee, and the other one is Lisa Anderson. She was on um, she needs to meet the bus, so she may. Yeah, I'm Are still you... on right now, Susan. Oh, oh good. So um, I, it's a definitely a, an effort between the two of us. It's not something that I that I that I do alone. And 
Um, I thought that we would just give a little information about the subcommittee. I see nurses on the on the call uh, and would love to have them as members of the Nursing Link subcommittee. Um, as they in on the very first day, Tuesday, um, there was an introduction to the committee structure. We are underneath the clinical LOINC committee and that's why we're presenting right now. But you can go down to our landing page and we have all of our minutes um, and agendas, um, slides, everything is published there for you to be able to see and retrieve. Um, we have our own mission and it, it as you know it, it 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 is around nursing so we support the nursing process we have nursing assessments um, goals and outcomes so if it's a nursing problem or a nursing diagnosis we would not make that in LOINC. that would be a snowmed code that that we would make and a goal can either be a LOINC code because if it's measurable or it could be a SNOMED code if you want to be normal thermic. That would be a SNOMED code. So, so it's, it depends on how you're doing your goals if you want to do it. Right now, we've just had the perioperative nursing data set approach us, and they want to start putting their outcomes in. Um, they didn't get burned by the grounding pad as an example of, of an outcome. So I'm just going to talk to you about our goals, we do content development and then we do education. Um, we had, uh, Rebecca Freeman came to us about, um, and I'll just see if I can go into that real fast. The, in US CDI, you can see they have the progress note, one single progress note. And, and this caused a lot of confusion in nursing um, because they are like, whoa, are you wanting to have all of the clutter of all of the progress notes? And um, so, so we reached out to Swapna and, and, and Reagan Streif and they, they said, we're giving feedback on this. They, they don't understand there needs to be more than one, one you know, type of progress note that they have in there. And so because of that, we had Dr. Bayorto, and I never can say your name right, come and give us a, an excellent tutorial on the document ontology and how it's used and the nursing role and where it is within the ontology. I gave a Realma tutorial. Um, and as some of you may have heard that that may or may not be going online, Tim and John, I hope that we still can upload our files and it would be lovely to be able to, um, we work hand in glove with the Nursing Knowledge Big Data Science Initiative and if we got our data set uploaded that we could all work from, that would really be awesome. Um, so I, I can give you some requirements um, for that in the future. Um, we, with COVID happening, we had the COVID Interoperability Alliance. Carol Mackenberg came and presented to us about what's happening in the Alliance. And um, we uh, had Tess Settergren and, um, come and speak to us about the LOINC copyright process. And Brene, I talked to you about that already. They, um, they have been trained now. I'm not doing it anymore. They have been trained on how to obtain copyright, how to create their, their requests, how to interface with the copyright holders and get their, their requests recreate, created. And they've also um, created a mapping heuristics, which the previous person from Canada we say when you map to SNOMED, how you map to SNOMED, this is for assessments um, where you look at for specific items, like we don't pre-coordinate the color with the finding. We use the colors. We don't use urine color yellow for urine colors. We use yellow. Um, and we have all those heuristics, heuristics documented for um, the assessments that we continue to work on. They're continuing to work with um, on the pain assessments and um, bring that to us. They uh, just got the copyright approval for NPASS and that is, um, is, has been submitted. And, um, and then, like I said, this, the request process that they've been working on. 
So they're still working on pain ad. I think safe environment for every kid is old from us because I've got that done. Right now we're doing the genital urinary assessment. If you go into LOINC and look for a, a physiologic assessment, you will see underneath there all your systems. That's early work that we did. We're going to be revising the value sets to be more semantically consistent and linked to SNOMED um, value sets. Um, we use the Value Set Authority Center. Um, from the previous conversation, it would be lovely if we could have some kind of an association with the LOINC code to show where it has resulted in another place and if, if it's a value set. So for us, I, I, I have value sets created in VSAC. And if you look at it, it says results this code, this code wound edge color. Results this code, um, you know, urine color. And so I specifically state that it results those LOINC codes, but there's no association that can be used computationally anywhere. And I would love to have that um, uh, across the industry. They're also working on peripheral and central IV. We only had three meetings this time. Um, crazy busy with what's going on with COVID. Um, it's a volunteer organization. Progress is slow, but we have some really, really knowledgeable members that are willing to participate and share. And uh, our average attendance is about 20 right now. We could use a lot more. Um, and and I, I'd have suggested I, I would like suggestions as to what we can do different to have more people want to participate and that's um, that's all that I have comments questions thank you Susan I don't see any hands raised or um, questions in the panel we did post the um, nursing website that you had on your slide there. We put that also in the chat for everyone to see. And we'll give it just a, a little bit longer for any last closing comments. This was the last session of our conference this year. And so Susan, you got to be the last one going. Yay. Yeah. Okay. Oh. I don't yeah, I was going to hand over to Marjorie. I don't see any other questions coming in and no hands raised. So um, I think we will, um, yeah, go, go ahead, Marjorie. Well, actually, I was going to ask you to throw up that, you know, that closing slide again, but I certainly can if you'd like um, me to. But before you do that, I wanted to thank the um, Clinical Law and Committee for this uh, very engaging discussion. There's lots of things that I think we'll need to, that we're looking forward to picking up. Um, I hope Dr. Lau and Anil Patel that we were able to um, at least get you started on your discussion um, on your issues with representing SDUH data elements and um, you know for your for Canada InfoWay or, or your project and um, we did start with the hard thing of of um, you know race and ethnicity that's very difficult. Although I, I, Rob, I have to say, I, I kind of disagree with you. I think we know the answers. We just have to figure them out. Um, and then maybe we turn it over to uh, Ted and Stan to see if they have any closing comments before we throw up that last slide, uh, April. Uh, I don't have anything other than just express um, thanks for everybody joining. And um, I love the discussion and the thoughts. I mean, it's. Uh, it's a complex fractal thing, and that's kind of what makes it wonderful to work on. <laughs> so, agree. Appreciate everybody's help, and and appreciate people bringing the real challenges that they're dealing with uh, into focus for us. Right, we'd like to see more of those. I agree. So, April, did we have that last slide? Uh, I want just... to I want to second Stan's remarks there. Thanks mm -hmm. to everyone uh, who's been participating, and Moink really, really only grows when we have input from the community because it's designed to be responsive to the community needs. And seeing these wonderful use cases and questions and things that, that make us think uh, being brought forward 
in, in, a, in a venue where we can all kind of think about them and comment them on together is uh, absolutely wonderful. And, um, and I want to extend my thanks to everyone. Thank you for that. And uh, one last thank you to our attendees, um, our, our chairs and co-chairs, uh, our team members, uh, attendees at the conference, our sponsors, donors, and like members. I think this has been a, you know, a great conference and uh, we look forward to seeing everyone in the fall. Have a good one.